is really, really starting to delve in to modern physics. I mean, we've done relativity. That's a big part of the transition from classical to modern physics. Um, the lecture last time was largely focused on photons and the fact that photons have wave and particle-like properties. In particular, we're interested in the particle-like properties. They have discrete sets of energies and they can be transferred to particles at energy. And in some cases, you can have photons so energetic that you could actually have the creation of particles through their energy. So those were those are little snippets of uh, looking at modern physics and we're also gonna be doing that again today. And our discussions are gonna eventually lead us to uh, the basic structure of the atom uh, that occurred during the transition from classical to, um, to, to, to quantum physics. One of those first things um, is the identification of discrete spectra. Now, <clears throat> the concept of spectra and how it's generated um, can, you know, you can kind of trace that back to um, the stuff we talked about in the last lecture, which was the Stefan Boltzmann law, Wien's law, looking at thermal spectrums and things like that. But we also have, and that's what's called thermal radiation spectrum or continuous spectrum. Uh, what we are interested in right now is what's known as discrete spectrum. And that's something that's very easily seen if you have some kind of discharge tube. So like, unfortunately we're stuck at in our homes right now, but we have a cup, few labs that we normally do on campus where we take uh, different gases placed in tubes, low pressure tubes, and, um, and we run an electrical current that goes through the gas there and it excites the atoms and produces the spectrum. And, and every, gas has a unique set of spectral lines in them. And um, in fact, this one, that's not mercury, is it? No, it's not mercury. It could be, don't remember exactly. I think it's sodium, actually. Sodium spectra. Sodium spectrum. Well, it's close to that. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's sodium. Looks like sodium. Anyway, so um, what's interesting about these lines is that they show up in a couple different ways. They show up as absorption or emission spectrum. And um, <clears throat> you get patterns of lines that show up. In some cases, you can get more absorption or more less emission depending on really the temperatures of things. But, um, but the idea is that each atom has these patterns to them. Every single element has a pattern of spectral lines that if sufficiently show up, uh, if you pass light through a cooler gas, we'll see the absorption lines. In fact, what this absorption spectrum is here you see a rainbow of colors because we have some kind of source of continuous spectrum comes in contact with a cool gas of some kind and uh, the lines appear when you try to look at that gas through something that can, like a spectrometer of some kind. Um, now, if you can look at that same gas, um, not having the light in the way, so you're just seeing the gas by itself, you'll get another pattern of lines that will generally resemble absorption lines. There can be additional lines there just depending on, again, like I said, the temperatures of, of things. Um, but it was, it's been of great interest, you know, at least from a classical standpoint, to understand this stuff. Um, spectral lines have been, you know, identified far before the knowledge of what atoms even were. So this was always a bit of a mystery. And in particular, 
<clears throat> hydrogen in the visual part of the spectrum, what's known as the Balmer series of lines, um, is uh, a very simple spectrum that shows a very interesting pattern to it. Um, this is some of the lines of hydrogen, and we can see that the space in between these lines gets sufficiently smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we have everything really tightly packed here. And then there's sort of a limit here to that series of lines. And um, interestingly enough, the reason we call it the Balmer lines is because there is a individual by the name of Johann Balmer who actually saw these patterns of lines and was able to actually match um, <clears throat> a mathematical formula that tells us what the sequence of these wavelengths are. Um, and by the way, this was like a total guess on his part. The dude was just bored <laughs> or something and saw these kind of pictures and it kind of invoked to him uh, an infinite series. And so <clears throat> he worked on different formulas and he came up with what we now call it the Balmer formula. And um, <clears throat> the formula is here. In fact, this particular formula is not really the Balmer Balmer formula. Um, it's the Balmer formula strictly if m equals two. And every uh, every line that you see are integers that are greater than m. So the first line that you would get here would be one over two squared minus one over three squared, and the result you get from that. 9.1, uh, 91.18 nanometers divided by that number gives you that first Balmer line. And uh, so this was interesting that there is some kind of integer relationship with the hydrogen spectra here. And again, this was not based on any physics. This was what we call empirical, just based on data and just trying things out. But um, we had notions around this time of discrete things on microscopic scales. And this, you know, the fact that there are integers involved here is actually really fascinating. So, um, but again, all this is really before we understood the structure of atoms. Um, and around the 1860s or so, came the development of uh, cathode ray tubes. And <clears throat> the idea with cathode ray tubes, we call this a Crookes tube, it's, it's cathode ray tube. Just Crookes tube, I think, has a particular like pattern or something. Let's see what Crookes tube, is that the one with the pattern in it? Yeah, it has like a, it's, it's just a normal cathode tube, something special with it, I guess. Um, but the idea here is we have um, a cathode here, which is basically a source of you know, negative charge, I guess is what we're saying here. And if the cathode was sufficiently either heated or uh, maybe a very large electric field was put in the presence here, for example, um, well, I won't say that, I guess, but... Um, then we see these rays come through here and it projects light over here. And the idea is that when the, the rays come in, they could hit this electrode, right? And it reads a current. So we know that there is some kind of transfer of charge happening here to allow our current to flow. Well, this caused a lot of people to sort of ponder what the nature of the cathode rays were. Um, there's clearly a space here. Um, they knew that, um, well, there's a lot of things that hinted at particles being involved as opposed to just light. Um, when these cathode tubes um, have just normal, sort of normal press, atmospheric pressures, the, the rays that come through here are either very small or non-existent. And then when you uh, create a vacuum in the tube here, uh, the rays are a lot more prominent. And the current is stronger actually here. 
So um, that kind of hinted at maybe a particle explanation for things. Well, J.J. Thompson did work in, I guess it would be like 1890s or so. And what he decided to do is apply a magnetic field to the tube. And what was interesting about applying the magnetic field is it caused the cathode rays to experience a deflection. And the nature of the deflections here is, um, now the velocity of the cathode rays, the direction, they're going to the right. Now, again, I don't know how many of you have taken Physics 120. You don't need Physics 120 to understand these things, but for those who have, um, if you do your right-handed rule here to determine the direction of deflection, the velocity is to the right, and uh, the way I do right-handed rule is I, you take velocity to the right with your right hand, and your palm opens up toward you, or you curl your fingers towards you, and your thumb points down, which is what the force on a positive charge would be, well, these deflect it upward. And so when you moved the, um, the electrode up a little further up, then a current became very strong in the presence of a magnetic field. And in fact, based on the strength of the magnetic field, there was a basically a function of where this electrode would be. So the fact that the magnetic field could change the direction of these paths uh, was the proof needed to show that cathode rays are really a stream of negative particles. And they can undergo effects of, you know, electricity and magnetism, um, the effects of electricity and magnetism. So um, there's a way to measure the effect of these. Um, in fact, what you do is you have your, your cathode ray tube here. You have a, generally, like I said, it's usually like a heating element. The idea is that when you heat this up to a very high temperature, it's very easy to dislodge electrons. And uh, over here, this little slit here can have positive charge that will allow the electrons to sort of accelerate through. And it, it sort of encourages this path here. Anyway, the electrons come in and we have uh, like a capacitor plates here uh, that uh, will fix the deflection of the electron. So the magnetic field makes the electrons deflect upward. Uh, the presence of the electrodes here from the capacitor plates will produce an electric force that is downward. And the idea is that if you could adjust your, either the charge in the electrodes here or adjust the magnetic field, you actually can produce a cathode ray that doesn't experience a deflection because the charges feel equal forces from magnetism and electricity. So from physics 120, the force that's exerted on these charges are QVB. Q would be the fundamental charge of the electron. For now, we don't know that's the case, so we'll just call it Q, VB, and then of course, that would either be a downward force here, which would be the electric force, which would be given by Q times E, which is the electric field. The Qs drop out. So basically what you're saying here, let me write this up so it's clear. Um, what you're saying is once you have the beams no longer deflected, the electric force is equal to the magnetic force. The electric force is QE and the magnetic force is QVB. The Qs drop out here, and we get this interesting relationship between E and B, solve for V, and that's how we get this relationship right here. Um, now, in terms of the deflection, um, the nature um, of the magnetic field's interaction, just forget the fact that we have an electric field for now, but you combine that with... Um, um, having those, when those charged particles come through, we have, we actually establish like another magnetic field where we have the charged particles move in a big arc in the magnetic field. And that creates circular motion. And so that's going to be another QVB for the force. 
and that QVB acts as a centripetal force, which we say is equal to MV squared over R. And solving for Q over M gives you this nice little formula here, V over RB, which based on the speed of the particles um, and the radius of that which they go in that circle, uh, one can um, actually solve for Q over M. And that's one of the things that many people did at this time. It wasn't just J.J. Thompson, but there was a, um, a very famous, uh, the, what's called the Millikan oil drop experiment was a good experiment on this where they measured charge to mass ratios. And this charge to mass ratio was established for these particles here. And, um, you know, this was a big deal because basically the discovery of these particles and the measure of their charge to mass ratio um, won him a Nobel Prize. And, um, and what he ultimately discovered was the first subatomic particle, the existence of electrons, the idea that these are part of atoms, but they're pieces of an atom that can actually be removed from the atom. That's a big deal. Um, not just the knowledge that matter is broken up into these, at the time, believed to be fundamental pieces, but these pieces could be detached from each other. And so this really set a lot of work for the next 20 or so years to really understand what's happening with, with atoms and you know, what they're made of. So, but the electron came first. The electron came first. And then it was very quickly realized that the electrons, they're responsible for the charge carriers and circuits and things like that. So that was kind of a big deal. All right, now comes the uh, nuclei. Now, nuclei are a bit harder to work with because they're more massive, for one. Um, the larger the nuclei are, um, the more electrons are involved. And if you really wanted to, you know, see effects from nuclei, you'd have to either be able to ionize those atoms or create some kind of very high energy phenomenon to see that. Um, this was 1909. Um, God, what was his name? Charles Rutherford. That was Charles. Ernest. Oops. Oh, it says it right here. <laughs> okay. Ernest Rutherford. Why do I think his name is Charles Rutherford? This sounds like a name from physics. Anyway, um, so he did an experiment where he took a radioactive, uh, a radioactive sample that produced an alpha particle. Now alpha particles are rather large radioactive particles. The fact they are, um, they're the nuclei of helium atoms. So they're two protons, two neutrons. But it's a, it was a commonly known source of radioactivity, uh, one that wasn't as harmful or as dangerous as uh, some of the other forms of radioactivity. Alpha particles are large. Uh, when they're discarded from a nuclei, they don't travel at the same kind of speeds as, say, other forms of radiation because they're larger particles. And um, they don't have the same risk to expose and sort of damage, you know, tissue and things like that just because of their low energy. Anyway, but... Uh, there's a lot of really common ways to produce alpha particles. And so what's done here is the alpha particles are produced here and um, they're accelerated through some electric field, basically a shot toward a group of lead blocks. The lead blocks are set up simply to um, create a, a, you know, a collated beam, straight beam. And then there was a, 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 a a very thin plate of gold made here um, and a screen placed behind it. So the particles are shot through and some of the particles experience deflections, um, which is from you know scattering off of particles in the foil there. In some cases, the scattering can be pretty extreme. It can be the really large angles and the fact that large angles are seen uh, means that uh, the size of the particles must be very, very large. If they're smaller particles, 
there would be very little deflections. If you imagine throwing something at small particles, you're not really going to deflect the things you're throwing at it. Um, generally, if you have something very large, you can have things bounce off the sides. And in actually some cases, this wasn't recorded in his initial experiment, and in some cases, the particles can hit and they can be deflected directly back. So that is a, you know, a, basically a type of elastic collision that's taken place there. Uh, but it does indicate that the particles are very, very large. And so that gave rise to the notion that the, the subdividing the golden foil eventually gets down to a atom. And that atom is a nucleus um, that is positively charged. Again, like the alpha particles are positively charged which results in the deflection. So what they're modeling here is when the alpha particle comes in contact, when it gets close enough, the electric force becomes very strong and there is a conservation of energy and momentum formulas that you solve. Pretty easy stuff, to be honest. Um, but those angles that come out tell you a lot about the size of um, the object and tells you a lot about the amount of charge that would produce those deflections. Because you can measure the incoming velocity pretty easily. And again, the gold foil is basically stationary. So if there's any deflection, it's simply a matter of um, you know, solving for conservation of energy, conservation of momentum problems. But um, the sizes they were getting for these atoms were incredibly small. I mean, they were, they were you know, far less than a nanometer. And, um, and with the knowledge of electrons, that caused a couple people around this time to develop models for what these atoms are. And really the first model of the atom was Rutherford. He created a model where the nucleus contains positive charge. It's very massive. That really defines the mass of the atom. And the electrons are in orbits. Uh, they're in motion of some kind that orbit the nuclei. And that electron, the orbits of those electrons really dictate what the size of the atoms are um, for the purposes of like some more lower energy phenomena. All right, so we're going to return to this in a moment here because I didn't finish about talking about what Rutherford had to say about atoms. But what we're going to do now is we're going to start to see a dichotomy in the explanation for what atoms are. Rutherford had sort of an idea for how that works. He it did basically work out the anatomy of the atom, but not really the inner workings of the atom. Um, there was no connection made, at least, to, like, spectra or how electrons may be responsible for, for producing that spectra. All right. Now, totally different topic, seemingly different topic. And this is the big one here. This is really the one that, that kind of marked the transition from a lot of the ideas we had, because classic physics kind of reached a, a roadblock. Because around this time, 19, early, early 1900s, there was a ton of various phenomenon that did not have proper explanations for things. Most of it involved in light. We talked before about the trying to model continuous spectrum, couldn't be done trying to explain, um, you know, spectra, difficult to do. Um, but um, there was a, a graduate student around this time named uh, Louis Victor de Broglie. And he actually, uh, he wrote, this is part of his dissertation, actually. Um, in fact, this is one of the more important discoveries of all of physics. And it was just this guy's like, PhD dissertations. And uh, he pondered the question if light waves have particle like nature to them, if light in certain circumstances can behave as waves and in other circumstances behave as particles, then would it not be true that some particles will have wave like properties? Um, and so the idea of matter waves was proposed by de Broglie. And uh, which is a, not a completely crazy idea, but one that, as you can imagine, might be very hard to 
to uh, to figure out ways to measure that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, the the logic here behind it is um, if we think about in terms of momentum. Now these are going to go back a little bit to Einstein's equations when it came to talking about. Uh, um, you know, energies and particles and things like that. But um, if, a, if a material particle, like a regular particle, had a momentum mv, um, then you could describe its wavelength. And again, this goes back to some of the photoelectric effect stuff we saw before. Uh, with the photoelectric effect, we saw that the particles had these... Um, had... Um, just discrete energies to them. These energies are given by um, HV, right? HV being um, uh, okay, right up here. So the discrete energies, shoot, are the particles HV, where V is the frequency, H is uh, the Planck constant. And uh, putting this in terms of um, wavelength, well, this would be given in terms of wavelength, H um, lambda, uh, well, C over lambda, sorry, C over lambda, not this, H, C over lambda. Um, and then recognizing from quantum, uh, not from quantum, from relativity, that the way we characterize momentum for particles that have wave-like properties is to say that the energy is the momentum times C. And this comes from that one equation was E squared equals MC squared. So this is just characterizing the momentum of these things. So cancel out the C's and we get this relationship right here. In fact, in his paper, this is what he simply proposes. He looks at different relationships. We're not deriving anything because you'll notice that this whole little calculation down the side here involves some of Einstein's equations, which if you have a particle of mass, you'd have to incorporate those things. But de Broglie's idea was that we could separate those two ideas. And in a lot, some circumstances, the two terms, the one with mass and the one with momentum, can, can weigh differently, basically. Uh, for a very high energy particle, they could be equal weight. But for very low energy particles, the mass is what matters. But if you have an extremely high energy particle, it would actually take on more of the wave-like properties. And so he proposed this. He proposed that the wavelength of particles would be given by H over their... Um, H over their momentum. So we know that's true for light. It's H over MC is the wavelength of the light. So we just simply replace v, C with V for the particles, and this is what we call the de Broglie wavelength. And so what this set off people doing is to sort of start to ponder all the experiments that involve waves uh, and involve light. Uh, could we apply particles in those sense, treat them as waves, treat them with this particular wavelength, which is given by their speed, and just see what comes of it. And it uh, turns out some very interesting things come of it. So let's go through that. All right, question for you here. So a beam of electrons and then a beam of protons are shot through a double slit with a very small slit spacing of one uh, micron. The electrons and protons travel at the same speed, which of the following is gonna be true? Okay, so just let me preface this. The idea is that we are testing things, right? We are going to test a beam of electrons and a beam of protons. We're going to shoot them at a double slit experiment. And we're going to see, do we get patterns like we do for light? So assuming that that's true, and by the way, it is true. What do you think would be observed here? The difference be in the mass of these things, right? So give me a letter in the chat. Let me know what you think about that. <clears throat> okay, so let me just start from here. The answer is A. Uh, the idea behind this is um, d sine theta would be equal to m lambda. And the m, that's just the order here. Um, and so that's going to be 
uh, times h over mass times velocity. So the idea is that the protons have more mass, they're going to have a much shorter wavelength. And having a shorter wavelength, um, your, uh, your space is going to be really small, right? The angles are going to be really small. And the electrons have a much wider interference pattern. So same speed for the electrons and protons and seeing the interference patterns be different is demonstrating that the differences in mass are correlating to effectively differences in wavelength because they're behaving that way. So that was something that was absolutely seen um, and that's actually a really interesting observation and it really supported the idea that of what we call the photon, that um, photons are particles, they're waves, and then also that can extend to things like electrons. Um, this is an intensity pattern for um, 500 kilovolt electrons passed through a double slip pattern. Um, and we try this with all kinds of things. Electrons do this. Uh, atoms generally do it. Um, ions and things like that. Which brings up a lot of really interesting questions because the idea behind the interference patterns is that there are constructive and destructive interferences taking place and somehow the particles are doing the same thing. So they have these wave-like properties and, 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 and the, the basis for studying that starts with de Broglie. Starts with saying, okay, the wavelengths are these. In fact, uh, uh, next Monday, when we do our first quantum lecture, that's where we start. We basically start with, well, these particles are waves. They have this energy and they have this momentum to them. And then if you remember when we talked about waves previously, the first thing we did is we sort of thought about the motion of material waves and then we created a wave function that explain what um, the waves do. Well, that's the very first thing you do in quantum is you recognize the fact that particles have wave-like properties. We list those wave-like properties and then we come up with a wave equation. And that wave equation is called the wave function. And then we just basically go through all the physics all over again and try to just do everything with the knowledge that we have these wave functions that we're working instead of particles. You'll see that Monday. All right, an electron is released from the negative plate. Is the Broglie wavelength upon reaching the positive plate is what compared to the wavelength of the negative plate? So the idea is that this is speeding up as it gets closer. Right, so what's that gonna result in? All right, good. The wavelength goes up, sorry, the speed goes up, wavelength goes down. Great, absolutely great. Okay, for a photon, the energy, frequency, we're using F for frequency and wavelength are related by the equations E equals HF. That was, I, I, I like V better, but we'll just use F here. It's actually not a V, it's a new, it's called, it's a Greek letter new. Anyway, uh, it could also be written as HC over lambda, where uh, the relationship between lambda and frequency is that the product is the speed of light. Uh, which of these equations would also apply to the electrons? Which of these equations do you think are going to apply to electrons? These three equations apply to light. Which equations, or maybe all of them, apply to electrons? What do you think about that? Well, the answer here actually is only A. And the we reason you would know is because the relationship, the last one here, F equals C over lambda, only applies for light because light goes the speed of light. The relationship that wavelength and frequency equals the speed of a wave, that's that's no, that's material waves, that's that's no, that's that's all stuff. The fact that B and C contain C in it. The speed of light means that can't apply to, to can't apply to any matter, any mass. But an equation like E equals HF certainly does. It absolutely does, actually. Okay, let's do a problem here. <clears throat> 
Oh, okay. Got it, Richard. All right. Let's bring up the example here. Do I have that somewhere? Probably not. Stop screen sharing then. Give me a minute to bring this up. All right, so we want to know what the De Broglie wavelength of an electron with a speed of almost half the speed of light and close to the speed of light. Okay, so these are relativistic speeds. Okay, these are relativistic speeds. So that being said, um, if we want to know what the wavelength of these are, that involves H over P. But P will need to be relativistic momentum okay basically if you got something i would say that if you're just to be on the safe side anything over 10 percent the speed of light just do relativistic because the relativistic correction while small still might be there so anyway um so we use um the fact that e squared Energy squared is equals mc squared squared plus pc squared. And the total energy of a particle relativistically is given by gamma, C, uh, gamma mc squared here. So we're going to put those all together. I want to clean that up as much as possible. Um, we can move over the... I didn't need to say all this, did I? Eh, it seems unnecessary. Hmm, why? I don't know why I did this. So you can, yeah, you can just do that. I don't know. This seems to be long-winded because we already have an expression for what momentum is. It's gamma mv. So I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I went through all this trouble here. You don't need to go there. You just need to just need to recognize that the speeds are relativistic, so you need to use relativistic momentum. I don't know why I did this. Okay, anyway, uh, the gamma factor for uh, 0.48c is 1.44. And so we plug this in for equation for momentum here, we get 4.43 picometers. And the one for the much faster speed is uh, gamma factor 3.75. Now the mass that you're putting in here, just to be clear, that's the mass of the electron. That is uh, mass of the electron given by, let me put my annotations up here. Me 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. That's the mass of the electron. So that goes in for mass here. Of course, H is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So those are the numbers that are going for H and going for M. And we get these. Now, these are insanely small i mean things like x-rays are like tenths of a nanometer and so we're talking about things that are a hundred times smaller so these are these are really not even i mean we don't have photons with this kind of wavelength they're, they're this is where we start to blend together what is a particle and what is a wave at this point because these are really high, this is high energy stuff really high energy stuff actually okay um So let me do one more example and we'll take our break. Yeah, let's do that. Because this is a natural break point. It's about to get into the atom. Oh, I'll calculate the Broglie the wavelength of a five gram bullet that's moving at 340 meters per second. Oh my goodness, this is a joke, right? Okay, let's do it though. <laughs> it's a bullet. It's going 340 meters per second. Um, so we have our expression here for uh, the Broglie wavelength for a particle, H over MV. 6.63 times 10 to minus 34. Make sure you put your mass in kilograms. And we get 3.4 times 10 to the minus 34 meters. So what you would do in a situation like this is you calculate the Broglie wavelength and you see that this number is absurdly tiny. And what that tells you is that this bullet will not be exhibiting wave-like properties. Because anything that involves wavelength and you try to incorporate this number, you're not going to see any kind of an effect. Okay, if you shoot bullets through at a double slit experiment, would that would that show fringes? Well, in the right circumstances, yes, but not a five gram bullet moving at this speed. 
All right, so let's get back to this. Um, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to go through um, sort of a lot of the concept involved in the structure of atoms. We're going to look at then the Rutherford uh, classical model of the atom. And then we'll look at the Bohr's mathematical model of the, uh, model of the atom. In fact, what I'm going to be describing to you right now, in terms of concept of how the how the, the atoms uh, how how atoms work, is what we just generally refer to as Bohr model of the atom. All right, uh, but the mathematics behind that stuff is going to be different between Rutherford and Bohr. So the idea with the the concept behind atoms is that <clears throat> the electrons uh, can only exist in certain orbital levels in the atom. Um, basically, the electrons are attracted to the protons. So that's the reason why they exist in the atom. And uh, the energies that the electrons have are discrete energies. The electron's not free to have any energy at once. Um, it has a particular... Um, pattern, I guess you could say, of orbital levels that apply to that particular atom. So if you change the number of protons in an atom, uh, you're going to have different orbital levels because there's going to be a different attraction to that to that nucleus and therefore different energies are involved. Uh, any particular arrangement of electrons is what we refer to as a stationary state. Now, the way that these stationary states look, uh, not stationary states, is that um, when the electrons are in their lowest level, which, as you know, you can fit two per level in the atoms, uh, with that's in the ground state. Um, if electrons get kicked to higher levels, um, they, have, they become excited. Um, the energy state is greater. The higher the electrons are up in the levels, the greater amount of energy they have. One analogy to think about is that for um, is that for uh, uh, like gravity, basically. And if you want to lift something, you know, objects are attracted to the ground. If you want to get them higher off the ground, then you would create a. Uh, then you have to create a higher energy state, greater gravitational potential energy, for example. So we talk about these electrons here. Being in these higher levels means a greater amount of energy that they have. Okay. Um, electrons can transition uh, from one level to the, to the next by absorbing the right amount of energy to go from one state to another state. There's a, at least a couple ways to do this. One of those ways is through photons. Photon absorption is an electron taking the energy of a photon and jumping to a higher level. Whereas photon emission is the an electron coming down to a lower level and releasing a photon that has the right energy difference between the original state and the other state. These photon energies, though, because they're discrete levels in these, in these atoms here, that means the uh, photons have to be discrete energies. Not any photon works, only the ones that work with the possible transitions that exist inside that atom. Uh, another way to do this is through collisions. You can uh, have particles uh, collide with each other and that can result in a transfer of energy which may result in an electron being kicked to a higher level. When they eventually kick back down, they release a photon. Uh, this is the basis for what thermal energy is. Um, uh, is the process by which you have these atoms, um, you know, because a substance has a temperature, uh, there's random thermal motions going on and particles will collide with each other. And combine that with the fact that particles are moving sometimes very fast speeds, um, when the electrons are, uh, when the uh, photons are finally given off, they could be Doppler shifted, so 
you can really experience any sort of wavelength from an object that's sufficiently dense and sufficiently hot. Um, the idea of these energies from the transitions plus Doppler shifts involve and eventually uh, give rise to that Planck curve, the thermal radiation spectrum. Okay, so um, this is how we sh typically model these energy transitions through what we call energy level diagrams. Um, so what they're showing here is these are particular energy states. So we say, for example, the electron has a particular energy to it, and it can exist at these states here. And so you see the arrows that go up, these are absorptions, the arrows that go down represent transitions. And the difference from one level to the next dictate the amount of energy that's required for the transition and therefore dictate the kind of photon that would allow that kind of energy. Uh, any energy in between is not allowed at all. You should con consider this, this is somewhat similar to the idea of walking up a flight of stairs. If you wanna go up the stairs, you gotta take these discrete steps. You're not allowed to take a step in between. It doesn't, the stairs don't support that. Well, the atoms don't support any energies in between energy states for the, uh, for the electrons here. All right, now question for you. A certain atom has two energy levels whose energy differs by 2.5 electron volts. In order for a photon to excite the atom from the lower energy level to the upper energy level, the energy of the photon, what? That has to happen. Gotta be B. All right, so uh, if the energy level difference is 2.5 electron volts, then that has to be an energy transition. There can't be anything in between, nothing greater, Nothing less has got to be exact, has to be exact energy. It's not like, I mean, think about it like this. If you want to do the stair analogy, uh, uh, you know, continue with that. What if you took a step that's a little bit too big? Oh, you could just lower your foot to the step. Well, the idea with the atoms is that the step that you take has got to be perfect. You don't have the ability to lower the energy or raise the energy. You can't take some of the energy. Um, if the energy difference is 2.5 electron volts, then you need to have a photon that has exactly 2.5 electron volts of energy. It's all or nothing. Okay. Okay, Adam has the energy level shown. A photon with a wavelength of 620 nanometers has an energy of 2 electron volts. Do you expect to see a spectral line with wavelength 2 uh, sorry, 620 nanometers in this atom's spectral emission. What do you think? What do you think? Two electron volts is a photon of wavelength 620. Any of these transitions do that. Why are you saying B, but this, it does work. It does work here. Energy of two electron volts. What, what, what transitions exist here? Well, we have one electron volt. If you go from three to four... We have two electron volts. If you go from three to five, that's the that's the transition right there. Would you expect to see a spectral line with a wavelength of 620 in, this, in emission? Yeah, you could if the electron goes to level three to level two. There would actually be, uh, uh, there's three electron volts here going from two to one and four to two, by the way, works for three. Do we have four? We don't. Do we have five? Yes. Do we have six? Yes. So there's a, quite a bit of lines here. If you pair up any two levels, that results in an, in an energy difference, and that means there's a photon that works. So <clears throat> you're looking at this, you say two electron volts, you're looking at differences, differences, okay? And that's just what the, that's what the electron is, be, is gonna be able to impart or take away. We're not talking about the actual energy. I mean, these are the actual energies of the electrons here, but this photon's gotta be the wavelength, sorry, the energy difference, that's the idea. All right, so an atom has energy states, uh, four electron volts and six electron volts. What is the wavelength of a photon emitted in a quantum jump from state one to two? Let's look at it. All right, so the change in the energy is given by HF. In fact, this little equation here has a lot more going on with it. So... We want to know what the wavelength of a photon is. Okay, so the photon's energy, E, photon energy, is equal to HF. 
which then equals the change in energy of the atom because it uh, looks like it absorbed a photon. So we're dealing with HF here. I'll uh, we'll change that to C over lambda. So we have this in terms of lambda, solve for lambda, and we get this. Now, um, electron volts, to remind you about that, um, one electron volt is equal to 1.6, that's a point, times 10 to the minus 19 joules, or you use a different value for the Planck constant. If you use a different value for the Planck constant, which is this one here, 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15, that's a minus 15 right here. Um, and that's in units of electron volt seconds. Instead of joule seconds, so there's basically two different values of Planck's constant you can use just based on what kind of units you're working with. If you want to work with electron volts, you want to go with this value here. And that corresponds to, well, 620 nanometers. So that's, look, four and six, that was what we were just talked about. Any any two electron volt transitions going to be 600, uh, 620 nanometers. So. All right. Good, 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 good. Another question. Got a lot of questions today. An atom has the energy level shown. How many spectral lines are seen in the spectrum? There's a bunch. There's five, it looks like. Five. Two are, two are identical, though. So you can go, you're looking for all the delta E's, right? So we got a we got a 1 EV. We got a 2 EV. We got a 3 EV. We don't have a 4. We got a 5 EV. And we got a 6 EV. We actually have two threes, like I said, but we have five. Just given this picture here, we got five transitions. So there are five pairs of levels with unique energy differences. Okay. Any questions about that? Anything not clear about that? Okay. Well, let's keep going then. <clears throat> All right. We got stationary states, zero energy, 3 EV and 5 EV. What are the wavelengths? What wavelengths are observed in the absorption spectrum and in the emission spectrum of the atom? All right, let's do it. Okay, so. Uh, okay, absorption is when you're going from lower levels to higher levels. So we can go from um, one to three and one to two and one to three. In fact, we can also go from two to three. I don't know why I don't have that here, but there are three transitions here. Why don't I have the third one? Well, it's the same for emission absorption, let's put it that way. So uh, the transition from one to two, we put the, you put in the EV values for the energy because land is HC over E, and I'm going to use the Planck constant for EV, 4.136 instead of minus 15. And we get 4, 14 nanometers, 248 nanometers. And if you do the, 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 the 2 to 3, which you can have, 2 to 3 is a thing on here, you get 620. And so if those are absorption lines, they are emission lines as well. If you can go up, you can go down. Okay. I don't know why I didn't put the 2, 3 here. That's weird. All right, so let's look now at the mathematics behind this. That was all the concept. Let's actually start putting some math behind it now. So in uh, in this in the classical, now we're just going to imagine that electrons are spinning around in circular orbits w with the nucleus, which is what Rutherford attempted to replicate that. And with that in mind, um, the electrons is going to experience this attributable force that will take the form of the electric force. So the acceleration that the particle experiences is going to be F over M. Um, the electric uh, 
Force is given by Coulomb's law, so Q squared over 4 pi epsilon naught, R squared. Again, 120 knowledge, but uh, that's just standard Coulomb's law stuff. Over the mass, and then we're going to set that equal to V squared over R, which is so what centripetal acceleration is. We solve for the velocity, and we get now here a function of radius and velocity. But the problem with this is this is not what's seen experimentally. Because this is saying that for any given distance, you can have a particular speed, which means, therefore, you can have any energy you want. This was not observed. Classically, we cannot explain spectra and some of the other effects here because this shows there is a continuous distribution of radii, speeds, energy. That just doesn't work. Bohr, uh, Nellis Bohr uh, was his name. Um, decided to not do the classical uh, description of it, but instead it's decided to incorporate the idea of a de Broglie wavelength. So the electrons, by spinning around, um, have a particular de Broglie wavelength to them. And here's where it gets really wild. So you remember standing waves back when we did waves. So Bohr's idea was that the electrons are not simply spinning, um, are not simply spinning around the nucleus, that they exist as a wave. And that wave is a standing wave. So, and again, we're gonna be getting into this in quantum, but Bohr put forth the idea that the electrons are not only have wave-like properties, but they also, while they're in their orbits, have a standing wave pattern. And the different energies that the electrons have correspond to the energy of the standing waves. Basically, how many nodes and antinodes exist in the standing wave pattern. As the energy goes up, you could have more and more nodes and antinodes but with this idea in mind, um, we can actually create a really interesting relationship. And again, this is based on the assumption that electrons behave as waves and that the electron in um, the atom actually produces a standard wave pattern as a wave. So if that's the case, then the circumference of that orbit is going to be given as some number of de Broglie wavelengths. And that number can correspond to different things based on the energy. So here is where we see that quantized nature come from. So when we looked at, you know, remember when we looked at like material waves, you know, a string that vibrates, sound in a pipe, Depending on the different wavelengths, we had a certain number of nodes and antinodes right here. And so we're doing the same thing. We're just saying, okay, in the orbit, the electron has a certain number of nodes and antinodes. And so the, the value of n here corresponds to basically different harmonics, different harmonics uh, of, these, of these hydrogen uh, uh, particles here. So 2 pi r is the circumference of the orbit. And we're saying that some multiple of the de Broglie wavelength, and we're going to write the de Broglie wavelength like the de Broglie torus to H over MV. Uh, we solve this for V, and we get this here, which is different than what Rutherford said. This is not any radius we want. This is discrete values because N is an integer here. And depending on what those integers are, determine what the velocities could be, and therefore determine what the radii can be. Now, one thing I'm going to do here is we're going to make a little bit of a substitution here. You will see the quantity h over 2 pi a lot um, moving forward. In fact, it is so common that physicists have just created uh, a, a separate symbol for it called h bar. It's an h that has a little dash going through the top of it. And it's just Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. And so 
the, these are the, these are the values that we had before, but just divided by two pi. And so then the equation becomes n h bar over m r. Okay. All right. So. Um, Okay, so the idea here is the electron is acting as a particle, acts as a wave. Um, requiring the electron to be a standard wave gives you these nice discrete values for things here. And uh, what we're going to do is now we're going to combine um, the idea we had before for velocity, but we're going to incorporate that... Um, here, so this is basically our expression for um, the radius of the electron orbit in the hydrogen atom. In, in, so we're recognizing the fact that when the electron is in here, it does experience that electric force. And so uh, this is n squared. That's going to be... Now, this represents what we call the quantum number. Um, in terms of standard waves, we refer to this as harmonics. Um, here, we're going to refer to this as quantum numbers. These are going to represent for us the different levels in that atom there. Now, all the stuff that you see here, let me go back for one minute here. Okay. So, um, once we go, uh, yeah, so it, we, and we take this expression, uh, the velocity expression that we had before, because that's not really going to be any different that velocity expression um, is still obeyed. Now it's just certain, you know, velocities that can exist there. And so this entire expression that's, you know, they have the n squared here, but the entire other part of the expression is all fundamental constants. This is amazing because this is, this doesn't, this is not dependent on what the electron is doing. It just depends on what the electron is. It's kind of astonishing. Anyway, four pi epsilon naught h bar squared over m e squared is a new constant. And that constant is what we call the Bohr radius. It has a value of 5.29 times 10 to the minus 10, which in terms of nanometers would be 0 0.05 nanometers. And so we can rewrite the radii uh, as this uh, expression in here. Now, by the way, just to be clear, this is all hydrogen. This is all just hydrogen. We're not considering any other atoms right now, and we're not considering um, any more than one electron, one proton. Um, part of the reason for that is because we can't. Um, trying to do this for, say, helium, it becomes very complicated because you have multiple interactions that take place. You have two electrons and two protons in the nucleus of the two protons, so you have an interaction between both electrons and the nucleus, and then you have an interaction between the electrons themselves. It becomes what's called a third body problem, which mathematically is very challenging to do from classical standpoints. So we're, that's why we're only considered hydrogen for this example. Okay. And so uh, the different radii that the electrons can have in the hydrogen atom are, are given by the simple equation right here. Okay. Now, going back to the, since we know the different radii that could exist, we can go back and plug this in for our velocity equation, and now we can see that we can have discrete velocities here. Um, if we rewrite this in terms of the first velocity, and we get this expression that velocity one, that's just what the velocity of the electron is in that, um, in that initial orbit, it's just given, it's just that over n. So the velocities get sufficiently smaller as we get further up here. Okay. Um, all right, so the total energy of the electron in its orbit is going to be given by the combination of uh, kinetic and potential energies. So the first term here is the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, and the second term is the potential energy. Now, this is an electron and a proton, and so the potential energy is negative, uh, e squared over 4 pi epsilon r n. And if we plug in our values for or Vn up here, and we plug in what we have our expressions for uh, Rn here, and we get this really big sort of monster expression here. But all this stuff is ultimately constants here. And um, an individual um, 
you know, term here is, is, is going to allow us to <clears throat> set what these energy states are in the hydrogen atom here. And we could simplify all of this into one really simple expression, which is this one down here. And so these are the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. Uh, when we combine all the mathematics here, we end up with 13.60 EV over N squared. Now, there's a negative here um, because, again, the potential energies here are technically negative because it's a negative and a positive charge interacting. And we set a zero point at zero EV when the electron is become ionized. So when the atom's ionized and the electron <clears throat> becomes free, it's a free particle at that point. And uh, then we don't speak of a potential energy because there's no interaction between them. So for level one, you can plug in one here and we get a energy state of the atom to be 13.6 electron volts. What that means is if you wanted to dislodge the electron from the atom, you're gonna have to use a photon of that energy. Okay, if you will put like an N equals two, that gives you the energy state of the second level. So that's the stuff we were just doing a little bit earlier where we had different levels. Uh, the way we dictated for hydrogen though is the ground level is minus 13.6, not zero. And then we go up from there. Uh, when you reach infinity, we say at zero. All right, so here's our basic Bohr model here with the discrete distances and energies. We're showing the first... Um, four states. We have our ground state and the first three excited states. On the ground state, the uh, energy, and we, we talk about this as, as the atom having this energy, but it's fair to talk about the electron because it's really the electron that does the transfer in here. I'm usually going to refer to it as the electron's energy, but it's fair to say the atom's energy as well. But in the ground state, the electron has the energy of negative 13.6 electron volts. It has this velocity 2.2 times 10 to the 6. So it faster runs closer in. And then uh, its radius is the Bohr radius. Uh, the Bohr radius goes up as an n squared factor. The velocity goes down by a 1 over n factor. So you just divide this by 2 and divide the first one by 3, 4, and so on. And then the energies go down as an n squared factor. So all of these quantities that are all very interesting for us, Energy, distance, speed are all related by integers. Integers. That's very neat. Okay. Can an electron in a hydrogen atom have a speed of 3.6 times 10 to the fifth meters per second? If so, what are the energy and radius of the orbit? What about a speed of 3.65 times 10 to the fifth? So the idea is that these speeds, this the speeds that we see here, they have to be an integer multiple of um, of the initial speed, right? So let's look at that. Okay, so, um, so our relationship here is Vn equals V1 over N. We got to figure out what V1 is. So our equation for V sub N is N H bar over M, um, Rn, where Rn, if for level one, would be the Bohr radius. So I have h bar over m Bohr radius here. I plug in those numbers. I got the 3.36 times 10 to the 34. Mass of the electrons here. This is the Bohr radius in meters. We get a velocity of 1.189 times 10 to the 6. So what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to divide the... Um, velocity here, the V1, by this speed, 3.6 uh, times 10 to the fifth. And we hope we get an integer. Well, if we do that, we get 6.08. So it's not an integer. The speed is not allowed um, in the hydrogen atom. Um, we're close, though. You can see we were close. And in fact, if we actually choose 6 as our value, um, we do get the velocity match in the second one here. So 3.65 times 10 to the fifth is allowed. It's quantum number six. That's the fifth excited state. So it's in the sixth level. We call it the fifth excited state. Its energy would be negative 0.378 EV. And the Bohr in this radius would be 36 times the Bohr radius. That goes as N squared. All right. <clears throat>
So if we're trying to see if these work, you got to just basically see if you're getting integers or not. That's the idea behind that. All right. Let's see how we're doing on our time here. I want to make sure we're good on time. I think we're very good on time. Yeah, we're almost done. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, let's see, I already said the energy is negative. Uh, that energy, uh, we call, call it binding energy. That just means uh, that's how much energy you need to give it to remove the electron from the orbit. So it talks about what, you know, if it's bound to the atom and if you wanted to ionize the atom by unbinding it, I guess you could say that's how much energy is needed. Um, for the ground state, that value of E1 is what we call the ionization energy. So that amount of energy is needed to rip the electron out of the atom if it's in the ground state. Obviously, you match its energy state in any other level if you want to ionize it from there. Okay. All right. Now, um, another aspect to this, since the levels are quantized and since... Um, you know, energy is quantized and the levels are quantized and the velocity is quantized, it stands to reason that the angular momentum is going to be quantized. And traditional angular momentum is just MVR. And um, so that being said, if you go back to our expression here, say for right here for V, um, MVR, you can see here, if I just move the MR up to the other side here, MVR is NH bar. And so, yeah, the angular momentum is also quantized, and it's the, probably the simplest relationship we have of all this stuff. We call it L for angular momentum, and it's simply a integer multiple of H bar. We will explore this a lot more when we get into quantum. Um, it's kind of something I'm just going to mention here. It's something that exists, and I'm, it's very simple, the relationship. But this becomes a much more meaningful relationship when we get into quantum because, as you know, this is one of the conservation laws we have in physics. We have energy, momentum, as and charge as conservation laws. And so this is going to be important when, when we are dealing with – because in quantum, if we have a completely different framework of physics, if we're just starting basically – over, which is what we do in quantum, we kind of start over and say, okay, particles are not particles, they can be waves. There are certain principles that still have to apply. So you have to conserve energy, you still have to conserve momentum. So anything you can relate to those quantities becomes very important um, when you're trying to study them. All right, so I already said this stuff here. Don't need to say this again. And so, okay, interestingly, if we then look at that relationship we developed there, and... Um, um, and we say, okay, well, let's go back to what Balmer had to say, right? Um, the energy difference between two levels of an atom is going to correspond to some frequency for a photon that would allow that transition. Well, if you flip this around and you turn this, uh, you basically have to flip this. Well, I mean, okay, right, F is C over lambda, so plug for F, you plug in C over lambda, that's what, C over lambda, that's what F is. Flip the equation, um, we have an equation for lambda here. Now the, the E's have a, these energies have a N squared in the denominator, and, um, and so what we could we take out a lot of the constants and we turn it into this formula here, which looks familiar. This is what Balmer came up with empirically. And what's beautiful about this is we're able to show with some basic assumptions about the actual physics, we could actually derive the formula that Balmer just kind of just came up with um, here. This formula matches his formula almost perfectly. Um, the value for lambda naught here, which would be the the the, early, the initial wavelength uh, for um, this equation here, um, 
is a little bit different. I think his value was nine one ninety one point eighteen or something. What was it? Ninety one point eighteen. Yeah, it was 91.18, and the prediction from Bohr comes up with 91.12. And you can see where all the constants are. So, I mean, Balmer came up with this, and it was very close to the actual value. Um, he didn't get it exactly right. Um, turns out that there's one correction that Balmer had to do that Bohr does, and we didn't really get into the details here, but... Um, the proton and the electron both have mass. And so because of that, the, when you actually go through these calculations, the center of the orbit of the electron is not really the center of the atom because there's a weighted mass average there. And so you have to do something called the reduced mass. Um, and what the reduced mass is, is just basically what the proton's mass or the electron's mass, and a, like a, it's a correction you make to the electron's mass uh, to take into account that the center of mass is maybe a little bit off center from the spatial center. And it's a very small uh, fraction because the proton is over a thousand times more mass than the electron. So it's an extremely small correction. As you can see here, the four significant figure is different between the two, 91.18, 91.12. So it's a very small correction, but it's nice to see that the numbers match up and that the differences are still explainable. So that's kind of neat. All right. So anyway, after Johann Balmer, all the transitions that start from level two, so either you go up from level two, or you go down to level two, are all called Balmer series. And in the uh, equation that we have back here, um, that's what M values are. So you choose an M of two, and then N is anything bigger than that. Um, the first, the ground state stuff is called Lyman. You go to level three, that's called a uh, bracket. Bracket, yeah, bracket. Level four is passion. Passion. The other one's called Lyman, Balmer. I think it's passion first. Yeah, passion, then bracket, then Bonhoeffer. I can't see all of them, but Lyman, Balmer, Passions 3, Brackets 4. Number 5 is what, though? Fund? Fund? Not, not Fraunhofer? Fund? Whatever. I don't know. That gets pretty high. Those become very irrelevant transitions. All right, we've got a couple more examples here, then we'll wrap this up. Okay. Fluorescence. Is the absorption of light at one wavelength followed by emission at a longer wavelength? So typical fluorescence is usually absorption of light at, say, UV, and then it's given off in the visual spectrum. That's a, a good example of fluorescence. A hydrogen atom, its ground state, the, one of the, the Lyman line, in fact, the lowest Lyman line, is uh, it gives it an ultraviolet photon of 95.10 nanometers. Merely after the absorption, the atom undergoes a quantum jump with a delta n equals 3. What is the wavelength of photon emitted in this quantum jump? All right, so um, okay, so the hydrogen atom, its ground state, absorbs an ultraviolet photon with this wavelength. That is transitioned from basically 1 to 2. And then it undergoes a quantum jump of delta n equals three. So that's that's a that's basically one up to five is what's going on there. One up to five. Wait a minute. Oh sorry, no, this is wait a minute. This is not clear. Wait a minute. I may have to rewrite this thing up. This is not clear. Mm. Yeah, anyways, the, what I meant to, ah, shoot. I didn't do this right here. Okay, the wavelength of 95 
nanometers, you want to work out what quantum number that is. So you take your equation here, you got to solve for the value of n. So this is, this equation is also referred to as uh, this r here. Uh, if you flip this equation so that it's one over lambda instead of just equal to lambda, then the constant that sits out there is uh, given by what's called the Rydberg constant, which it has a value of 1.097 times 10 to the 3. Um, that's just inverse meter units there. Um, so we're going to plug in our wavelength here. We're going to figure out what quantum number we jumped up to. Turns out we jumped up to 5, okay, with that wavelength. Um, then we, after the absorption, the atom undergoes a quantum jump, and the assumption is that because we're emitted, we're going down. So we go down to two. If you go down to two, then the atom is going to emit a 434 nanometer photon. So in this case here, the 95 is an ultraviolet photon. You can't see those, but if that's incident on this, on the hydrogen atom, we won't see the absorption that take place. We'll just see this glow as they kick back down. They can kick back down three levels, but they could kick down other ways as well. This is a wavelength that you can see, though. If it kicks down to, say, three, that's an actually uh, an infrared line. You wouldn't be able to see that one. If it kicks back down to one, that goes back to the 95 nanometers. Couldn't see that one. So um, generally, it's a transition at one wavelength that you can't see and a transition that you can see. Um, so in this case here, that was it. But you'd have to take this wavelength to get the quantum number first. All right, last example here. When astronomers look at distant galaxies, they find that light has been strongly absorbed at the wavelength of the 1, 2 transition. That is the Lyman series. Uh, first Lyman series, actually. The absorption tells us the interstellar space is filled with vast clouds of hydrogen, yada, yada, yada. So we're just going to do the basic, we're going to use the formula to figure out what the Lyman series transition is. The M value would be 1, that's where we start. 2 is where we finish, that's the value for N here. Um, and then this is our Rydberg constant. Uh, and so we got to solve for the wavelength here. Uh, this is going to be 1 minus 1 fourth, which turns into 3 fourths. And we flip all that. We get 4 thirds uh, divided by R. And that comes out to the wavelength that we know for Lyman alpha. It's 121.5 nanometers.